Well, welcome. Thanks for showing up. Thank you. Who am I? It's me. I'm Mike, the longtime aquarium enthusiast. So why should you be listening to me? I've had aquariums for over 30 years. I worked at different fish stores and I have a master's in biology. And then obviously I clean tanks for a living. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing it day in and day out. Um, aquascaping. So this class is all about aquascaping. And for different people, there's gonna be different definitions of aquascaping, you know. For some people, setting up a tank is a really simple process. You throw some stuff together and that's fine. But for me, aquascaping is creating a beautiful piece of living art where you're looking at natural elements like wood, rock, and live plants, and you're combining that in an artistic way to create a natural looking aquarium. So some things you can really think about when aquascaping are um, creating open spaces and contrasting that with dense jungly spots. You can have a carpeting plant or you can use sand at the front. There's so many different tricks and methods and styles. We'll go over some preset compositions to just give you an idea if you don't even know where to start, um, there's some basic templates you can follow. So this is what I'll be covering today. Different methods and styles. Plant biology is super important for aquascaping. If you set up a nice tank but your plants don't do well, then what's the point? <laughs> um, and then part of that is algae like you were talking about earlier. You don't want things to get smothered in algae, finding a balance. So that ties in with essential equipment and then non-essential equipment upgrades that I like. Um, the process of setting it up, maintenance, algae, and Q&A. So different methods and styles. Uh, one of my favorite aquascapers is George Farmer. He took this ancient Chinese proverb and he says it a lot. There are many paths to the top of the mountain, but the view is always the same. So fish people can be kind of stubborn. If you go to fish stores, you'll get people telling you like, oh, it's gotta be this way or the highway, you know? And that's really not the case. There's so many different ways to set up a tank. So I'm gonna be going over my preferred methods. I'll include some, some tidbits of info about some other styles and methods. But just, just keep in mind if someone's telling you there's only one way to do it, you know, they're maybe not the best person to get advice from. <laughs> so there's really two paths to aquascaping. The first one is you have a plan in mind and you assemble all the pieces to get there. So you can like actually draw out what you want your tank to look like on paper and then assemble the pieces to get there. Or you can just kind of start throwing some stuff together and see how it looks, tweet them as you go. If you watch YouTube, this would be like the green aqua approach and this would be the MD fish tanks approach. And both tanks can look really cool. There's a time and a place for both. Um, yeah, just a matter of what you want to put into it, how much time and, and planning. And if you even really enjoy the planning process, if you're more of a kind of improviser, then the second approach is really a good way to go. So this is an example of a simple layout. I didn't really put much time into planning it. Um, I just threw some river stones in there, or Mexican beach pebbles, and then uh, just three, four types of plants and called it good. And it still looks good, but if you compare it to maybe my most complicated tank that I ever set up, I spent about two months planning this and laying things in place, slowly gluing things, taking stuff away. Um, yeah, lots of planning involved, but pretty. Thank you, I appreciate it. Also good mountain scene. Almost yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was a it was a tribute to my dog who passed and. We did a lot of hiking together, so I collected a lot of the stuff with him from Red Feather Lakes area, like all the granite there, uh, the pebbles from the pooter, and then the branches and stuff. 
minus the of the cerium stone in the back. What kind of stone is it in the back? Is cerium? It's a type of limestone. So, um, I did look for rocks that resembled mountains, but I had a really hard time finding them since most of the stuff around here is going to be granite that looks kind of like this, which is still pretty. And it's a good way to actually create different layers, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite tricks in aquascaping. Mm -hmm. So if you think of each, each layer, like you can't really see this, but there is a sand bed along the front. And then there's the river pebbles. So that's one, two, and then the granites, the third layer. And then we have the plants and then the close up trees. I use big ones and then smaller branches in the back to mimic trees in the distance. Mm -hmm. And then a different stone, which is kind of a faux pas for some people to use different types of stones. But by doing that, I, I think I created another sense of depth, like a really, really far out deep, feel. Yeah. yeah, it does look deep. Um, this tank definitely had its cons when it came to cleaning. Like, yeah. <laughs> getting your hand in there is kind of tough. And then uh, eventually there was a decent bit of algae on a lot of these mountain peaks because they're so close to the top. So. That's not generally my suggested method for setting up, at least a beginner tank, I would not go there. But even for me at this point, I usually like to put wood on top of rocks and then plants on top of the wood like moss or ferns because it protects them from algae. But even the wood, uh, if you have a dwarf placostomus like an albino bristle nose or rubber nose, um, they do a really good job at cleaning wood, not so much with rocks. So, yeah. I hate scrubbing rocks. <laughs> I know I've, I've heard about some people who will drain the tank, you know, this far down, and they'll literally go with a paintbrush and paint Excel or some other algicide on the rocks. Wow. And then that will kill all the algae, mm -hmm. allowing critters to eat it. But we'll dive more into algae later. <laughs> Um, so it's your process really make it as simple or complicated as you want I do think that um, doing some sort of unique design is important because it gives you ownership in your tank the more fun you have setting it up the more you're going to be involved with maintenance when people just throw stuff together sometimes or when I do at least it's easier for me to just kind of lay back on maintenance. But the more effort I put into setting up a tank, mm -hmm. the more diehard I am about letting it, um, or not letting it fall apart. Mm -hmm. And I notice that with my clients as well. So different compositions, where do we even start? Like, let's say this is your first uh, real attempt at aquascaping. You might not really have any idea of where to start. Like, where do you put your rocks? Where does the soil go? What are some general designs? How do I make it look good? Well, there are some compositions you can follow. This is largely from um, some Japanese uh, artists or aquarium designers, ADA. Um, and they've come up with these templates, basically. And they work really well. You can basically duplicate them, um, kind of like a PowerPoint slide template, just plug and go. So the first one, is my most favorite composition. It's the triangular composition. Kind of speaks for itself. Uh, you don't necessarily need grass up front. You can have sand or whatever, but you taper it down. So one side is very lush and bushy, and then the other side is open. <coughs> and I always will butt up the lush side against a wall. So if you have a room that's very open on one side and closed on the other, you always have the bushy, overgrown side on the closed end and then the open side on the open end of your room. Just complements it very well. It's easier for viewing. And it's also nice for your fish because they have this hiding area. People are less likely to be where the wall is scaring them. So they always have kind of a safe spot and it just works out that way. <clears throat> so you can kind of play with the triangle composition 
even throughout the life of this aquarium, I changed how I would trim plants. So initially it, what, it did really adhere to this triangle very well, but as time went on, I let some plants grow, grow out more and other plants less. I played with kind of uh, different patterns up top and it's fun to change your aquarium over time. I'm always adding new plants or taking others away, moving them to different aquariums. So it doesn't have to be set in stone. It can be something that changes as you, as you see fit. The next one is the island composition, also called the convex composition. So basically, um, basically with this setup, uh, it speaks for itself. Get rid of that mouse. Um, you have an island in the middle. And so generally what I would do in a high tech tank with CO2 and lots of fertilizers and a strong light is I would grow uh, a carpet everywhere along the bottom. But in a low tech tank where you don't have all this equipment and you're worried about algae maybe, you wanna use weaker lights. And I would cap the bottom with sand and a few different types of um, pebbles to kind of add some diversity there. Um, so here's an example of an island layout. I actually do have CO2 in this tank, but because it's so tall, I am struggling actually with algae in here. And so it would be really hard to get uh, a carpet down there with the wood up top uh, without getting it blasted with algae. So I'm kind of easing in with this tank, experimenting. I'm gonna replace all this moss with stem plants. I'm just tying the stems to the wood and it's actually growing. Um, not the recommended way, but um, it works. And then the double island, otherwise known as a convex tank. Uh, also pretty obvious. There's some really beautiful tanks like this. Um, I think the ADA gallery, you can go online and look at it, is really good for inspiration. They're definitely next level trendsetters in the uh, aquascaping world. But um, uh, some of their tanks are, are the most beautiful double island or convex layouts that I've ever seen. Um, so even beyond those three templates or compositions, we have specific styles of aquascaping. So the classic nature aquarium, that's a really good one. Uh, it doesn't really have to adhere to any rules or anything. You just use the natural elements, grow healthy plants, and lay things wherever you want. The Dutch style is all plants. Windmills? Well, yeah, exactly. Windmills, <laughs> tulips, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Uh, oh, and panorama is actually diorama. I got confused, but we'll go over these. Uh, classic nature aquarium. This is uh, a low tech setup. It was uh, a very budget friendly one. It's at the Cat Cafe. If you haven't been, you should go. It's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I used used substrate in the back, so that was from an old tank, and plants just grow just fine in there. All really easy plants and some simple hardscape in there. The fish are breeding like crazy. Um, it's a really healthy tank. And it's easy to maintain. I spend about 45 minutes once every other week on this tank. And then this is an Iwagumi style. That means that we're not using any wood, it's rocks. So it's basically a rock garden. Um, and you would use only grassy plants or low growing plants because you want the rocks to be the centerpiece of this tank. And then a Brazilian style is basically where you mix stems in in the background. So maybe over here you'd have some stems. There's often some red pops in a Brazilian style tank. So um, you'd use grassy stuff up front and then um, lots of good shapes in the back too, by the way you trim them. That would be more Brazilian. And then Dutch, yeah, there you go. 
Uh, plants, plants, plants. No wood, no rocks, no sand, nothing. Just plants everywhere. And one of the coolest things about the Dutch tanks is how you get these clumps of plants. So it's very organized. Uh, it's not really my preferred style when I go to set up a tank, but I do enjoy looking at them. Like the fish crew, that's kind of their method. They like the Dutch style. Um, and this is one of the older techniques in setting up aquariums, kind of even before uh, this crazy aquascaping got started with trees and mountains and forests and replicating what you see in real life. And then the diorama, we already looked at this tank, but you could even do a desert tank. I've seen people make cactuses or cacti and um, uh, really anything you want, a cliff, a forest, mountains, streams, you name it. All right, plant biology. This is super important. This is gonna to relate to algae later when we go over that section um, because healthy plants deter algae. That's one of the best ways you can deter algae by growing healthy plants. Plants have three, four basic needs, essentially three when we're talking aquariums. Light, nutrients, CO2, and then water, but that's already taken care of in your tank. Um, plants photosynthesize, so they take in sunlight and they use the energy from that light kind of like solar power, and they break apart water and carbon dioxide, and they use some nutrients to create their own food, glucose, sugar, basically. And then oxygen is basically a waste product, a byproduct that they release into the water column. So if you ever see the little bubbles in your tank coming off your plants, that's oxygen. Now, we'll go into each one of these in a little more detail. So, kind of the old school way that you used to see light labeled was by nanometers. And yeah, it may even be on this tank here. Oh, I like Kelvin. Yeah, yeah, that's more the new way of doing it. So yeah, before you'd have to go through and, and make sure that the spikes corresponded to where chlorophyll the pigment that plants use to absorb sunlight, you need to make sure that these spikes are appropriate for what, what the spikes that chlorophyll need in order to absorb sunlight. Fortunately, there's a much easier way now of doing it. It's with Kelvin. And so we're looking at the fluval flex here. It says the light is 7,500 Kelvin. So um, you're looking for, that's, I, I made a mistake here, it's 65 to 7,500 Kelvin. And that's a full spectrum light. That means it includes all the colors that plants need to grow. So you'll also see RGB, red, green, and blue used a lot. That refers to the colors of the diodes and LED lights. And even though you see red, green, and blue, when they are all combined, it looks white. So that's what's happening with the sun. There's a bunch of colors, but they're all combined. We interpret it as just light, white light. You know, that's kind of the standard color or bright light, yellowish to white. Um, so when you're looking for lights, I would much prefer going with Kelvin over um, nanometers. And if you can set the Kelvin, I usually go on the 6,500 end. It's a little more yellow than the 7,500, but it's really not that big of a difference. So CO2, we talked about light. The light hits the leaf for photosynthesis, but in order for photosynthesis to occur, there needs to be CO2. So whether or not you're pumping CO2 into your tank or injecting it, it's already there. CO2 is in our atmosphere. When the surface of your tank is agitated by your filter, it's gonna bring CO2 in. Or when just, 
just by diffusion, you know, um, gases go from where there's more to where there's less. But really the most efficient way to get CO2 into your tank is to inject it. And we'll go over that in more detail later. Uh, another thing that CO2 does besides helping plants grow faster and with more color, like some of your red plants will only get red with CO2 and, and strong light, is it lets you keep difficult plants. So most of the plants we keep in the aquarium hobby are actually grown emergent in their natural state. So they need lots of water, their roots are set under water, but then their leaves can be partially under and then largely over outside of the water. One of the reasons that CO2 is so beneficial for these plants is because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. And so that's their natural state, that's how much CO2 they get, and they would have a harder time surviving completely underwater. And so you may get some of them to live, but they won't look very good. They'll have leggy growth, or the leaves will be kind of curled and deformed. CO2 will allow you to grow those plants, as well as the easy plants with more volume. So when you want to inject it, there's a few components. You have your pressurized cylinder. The CO2 in the cylinder is actually liquid and it's pumped at a very high pressure. So in order to get it to a working pressure, you need a regulator. Um, and that's so that when you open the valve, it doesn't just spray out like crazy. This allows you to slowly use it. And then you, um, you have a diffuser and that slowly bubbles into your tank. And then it's a good idea to get a drop checker with some solution in there that will allow you to measure CO2. There's some more technical ways to measure it, but this is the easiest way. Nutrients. So another thing that plants need are nutrients and they can get this through the substrate and the water column by using fertilizers. So I recommend that people do both. For, for, for lower tech tanks, you don't always need liquid fertilizers. Um, I still think it's a good idea to do it at least once a week, a small dose, but there's different kinds of nutrients. So you have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Those are structural. Those you see in basically any living organism. It's, it's the building blocks of life. So if you take the plant and dry it out, this will account for the overwhelming majority of the weight of the plant. And then you have your macronutrients and micronutrients, so smaller percentage of the plant and then even smaller percentage of the plant. And as you get more into the micronutrients, these are important for regulating internal processes inside a plant. So things that are a little over our heads and it'd be kind of boring to talk about anyways, but it is important and fish will excrete some of these as waste products but you're really not going to get this from fish waste so that's why you need to have liquid and or um, fertile substrate so my favorite liquid fertilizer is this two hour aquarius ap3 or apt3 it's low in nitrogen which you get from fish waste. So this is a good one because it helps to keep your algae down. Um, and then the way I know how much fertilizer to use, there's instructions on the back, but every tank is different. If you're using lots of light and CO2, you're gonna be depleting these nutrients quickly. If you don't, then it's hard to know how much to put in because the instructions are usually for high tech tanks at least on a fertilizer like this. So I use nitrates as an indicator chemical. Um, and I shoot for five to 20 parts per million. So I'll check that a couple times a week or a few times a week when I'm getting my tank established and learning how much nutrients they're using. 
And then you can also see after one dose of fertilizer, how fast does that get depleted? That's a really good indicator that your plants are using it, if they're getting enough, if you need to be using more. If your nitrates are at zero, then your plants don't have anything to consume. And so we can assume with a good fertilizer like this, because I've used it for years, I know it's a good one, that things are balanced. So if you have nitrates, then you likely have all those other uh, macro and micro nutrients that we talked about. The other way is you can buy 3 million test kits and test each element individually. I know there's some stores that suggest that, and I would say they're absolutely bonkers crazy. That's like a full-time job, testing your water for all those things. This is a, uh, you know, a, a method that I've tested and it works very well. It's not perfect. You can sometimes have deficiencies in this or that, but it's kind of a rarity. You know, if you do have at least 15 parts per million nitrates, then you're not going to be having deficiencies of other stuff. How do you measure the parts per million? You get a test kit. So nitrates is one of the easiest test kits to find. Once you start getting into stuff like... Is that just the API? Yeah. Okay. I have the master freshwater test kit, okay. and nitrates is one of those. Yeah. Okay. So it's the same one. Yeah. And once, once your tank is cycled, you don't really need to test for ammonia and nitrites. And that's not really even a nutrient for the plants anyways. So just stick with nitrates. And I mean, good luck finding a boron and manganese and a lignum test kit, you know? And you so, really do need the 50% water change? You don't really need it, but to keep a crystal clear, sparkling clean tank, um, I think every other week is where most of my clients land on water changes. Oh, I do. Yeah, but usually not fifty percent. Fifty percent can go a long way. Um, there's something about water changes that algae hates, mm -hmm. and plants love. So after a water change, I notice like the rest of the day my plants well, are photosynthesizing mm -hmm. like crazy. Mm -hmm. So if you don't inject CO two. Uh, there is CO2 in tap water. It's mm -hmm. used to reduce the corrosiveness of water on the infrastructure. And so even though it's not a crazy amount, it's enough to boost plant growth temporarily and to punch algae in the face. So you don't, yeah, you don't have to do 50% water changes. And I mean, I have a YouTube channel, I'll like explain water changes every time there's someone that's like, oh, if you're doing water changes, you're doing it wrong. So there are ways to set up tanks where you don't have to do water changes, but you're usually not gonna get a nice looking aquascape like this. It's more about setting up an ecosystem tank that more resembles a pond or something, which is fun, but, <laughs> but we're looking at more of the artistic side today, which is why I didn't dive into that too much. But then the other thing you think about is stocking a tank like that. So if you have a big tank with lots of plants and you only stock it with minimal small fish, then you can get away without doing many water changes. But the other thing in Fort Collins and maybe some other places along the Front Range is we have really soft water. So if you have a tank that doesn't have limestone or something that's putting general hardness or carbonate hardness into your water, without doing water changes, that's gonna get depleted quickly. You know, you can either put a little limestone in to help hold you over, or doing water changes puts those elements back in the water. So plants will consume some of that calcium and magnesium, or what, what we think of uh, hardness in water, and those are both things that plants consume. So. I notice in my tanks where I don't have any limestone, I fell into this pattern a while ago where I thought, okay, my nitrates are very low. I don't need to worry about water changes. Things are clean. But then I noticed that my GH and KH were bottoming out. And so um, either add some limestone to those tanks to help or do water changes. 
I also like doing water changes and kind of a statistical anomaly, but that's why I have this business too. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of a fun process. We put on like YouTube of other people cleaning fish tanks. And there's like, you know, fish zone. multiverse, yeah. <laughs> um, so as far as essential equipment goes, some of it's kind of obvious, aquarium stand, filter lights, heater, substrate. Um, although when it comes to a stand, I've put tanks on the floor in the past, it's doable, but you can't siphon them without the help of gravity. Mm -hmm. And you also can't look at them. Like I have a temporary tank right here right now, because mm -hmm. it was in my garage and now it's winter time and I had to migrate it inside. But it's a horrible spot for it, I'm gonna move it. Um, yeah, and then it needs to be a level surface. So if you have a glass bottom tank, like the Fubal Flex, mm -hmm. then it needs to, um, it needs to have a foam mat underneath or a pad, which it comes with. Oh. Filters. There's so many different types of filters. I think built-in filters or canister filters are the best approach. And so with this class, I recommended the Fluval Flex because it has a built-in filter. And, you know, for the price of this whole tank, you can not even buy this filter. Yeah. <laughs> this is a terrific filter, though. It really is the best canister filter. That's what I have on the zipper thing. What kind exactly. Of yeah. yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great. It's a Awaze Biomaster, mm -hmm. and then the version that I like is the Thermo. So mm -hmm. it comes with the heater built into it. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really nifty. And then the other thing is, this little part here, they're pre-sponge filter, or pre-filter sponges. So you pull that ring out, and then, or you pull the tube out, you open it, and there's a bunch of little ring sponges. Ring them out in a bucket of water. It takes like one minute, two yeah. minutes to clean out. And then you have to clean your whole filter once a year, if that. So it makes maintenance a breeze. It also does a terrific job at cleaning the water. Uh, because I'm going around people's houses cleaning tanks, I work with all sorts of filters, um, and working with other people's equipment can be hard sometimes when you don't know it. And one of the things that really like gets me irritated is when I can't get the filter started again. <laughs> and like the, the buttons don't work. Yeah, I've had that with your house. Yeah, you did. But that's that you're not alone. There's <laughs> many places where it's like they have their little tips and tricks, and I just I've never used that product, so. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I have some at home. I have cheap canister filters that I like get a cardio workout just getting them started again. But this one is super easy. A couple pumps on the prime or to prime the filter and it gets going. So I really, really, really recommend that filter. It's not something you'll see in stores yeah, order. around here. Yeah, I think it's pretty big in Europe and Asia, yeah. but um, should be something that we see more up here. So there's also other types of filters, under gravel, slightly outdated, good for gravel bottom tanks. I would not recommend for planted tanks because the way you clean it is by uh, gravel bagging. And you can't really do that with a heavily planted tank. It'll destroy the roots. Mm -hmm. So sponge filters are okay. I use them in hospital tanks or temporary tanks. They're not good for circulation. And circulation is essential with a planted tank. You want five to 10 times uh, the, the total tank volume turnover per hour. And you, you won't get that with a sponge filter. Hang on bags are okay. They're a good bang for your buck. They're really, really good at getting water to move and they're very affordable. So I think that's a good alternative to using a canister filter. Uh, I use them on smaller tanks in particular, but once you get to big tanks, I recommend either using a sump or a canister filter. And then lights, we already talked about spectrum, but 
when it comes to picking the right light for your tank, it really boils down to whether or not you're using CO2. So if you're not using CO2, don't bother getting a fancy expensive light that's got high intensity because your plants are limited to how much they can photosynthesize. So imagine their maximum photosynthesis rate of like, let's just say 100, you know, max 100%. Without CO2, this is totally made up. I don't know what the ratio is. Let's say they can only do 30% of what they would normally do with CO2 then all this light is being wasted. The plant can't use it. So that's when algae comes in. Algae's like, hey, I'm gonna take advantage of this situation. You got all this light, no one's using it. I'm gonna grow on the plants. Algae can grow in harsher conditions than plants can. So if there's not enough nutrients for the plants and there's a lot of light, algae will come in too. So you almost have to think of it as a triangle between light, CO2, and nutrients. And whenever that balance is off, that's when algae comes in. So, you know, it's like getting a really fancy sports car and then putting bad gas in it. That's how I equate getting a fancy light without CO2. Even a cheap, low intensity light with CO2 can work wonders. So the Fugal Flex doesn't have a crazy fancy light, but when you throw CO2 in there, it can do incredible things. I mean, you can just have the luscious, luscious tank. And then substrate. There's two common approaches to this. There's the kind of more old school method, dirt capped with sand or gravel, and I used to do this when I was younger because they didn't have all of these products nowadays. I'd literally go to Home Depot, buy some sphagnum peat moss, throw it in the bottom, cap it, and grow plants in there. Nowadays, we can buy aquarium soil. So it usually comes as some sort of clay-based or volcanic um, material, little, little pebbles. It's in there. Yeah, yeah, little round pebbles. Um, is that something you use? I was using the, I think it, the called, they have it in, in the tank, in the plant tanks at um, Fish Crew. Oh yeah, sea chem fluoride, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I personally love that stuff. I mean, I like it and everything, but it killed, ended up killing my catfish. Mm. Yeah. If that's sharp. Exactly. Uh, totally, yeah. So. It's under the rock. Sorry. Pull it out. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Just pull it out here and I'll show you an alternative. Um, did you have quarries or? Yeah, yeah. Quarries, they, they, quarries. they lose their whiskers first yeah. and then, yeah. Yeah, that stuff's not good for quarries. It is, it's, it's got mixed reviews in the aquascaping world. Some people say it's pretty low quality um, and it's not good for growing plants, but I have totally not experienced that. Yeah, it seems like my plants grow really well. They love it. Yeah. So this is this is basically a little humid in there, but they're just little pebbles. They're soft. With quarries, you should always have some sand in there too to get their whiskers in. And what I've started using for quarries recently is um, pool filter sand. So I used to use oh, I used to use um, play sand. It's a little bit cheaper and it looks nicer. There's a little bit more different gradients in there, but it's also sharper. And so as soon as you touch pool filter sand after having your hands in play sand, you'll be like, whoa, this is very soft. I should be using this. Yeah. So does it only come into one? It's it's pretty white, yeah, but it it's got a brownish hue to it. It does look fairly natural, I think. But yeah, if you want a darker color I don't know about that. I've never seen it in stores, but there is one fluorite, or what is it? What did you say it's called? Sea King fluorite? Is that what? Yeah. Said it's called? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's so many different options for sand, but that's one thing that's been more so on my radar lately. Um, now that you bring it up, I'm switching over to pool filter sand. I also have banjo catfish, which bury themselves completely. Oh wow! They're like 
that they love that. They love it, yeah. And I put leaves in the bottom too, just for my backyard and they hide in there. Uh, I spent a ton of money on that sand too. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think 55 gallons, so. Oh gosh, yeah. It's a lot of it. You know, you throw it away with Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I've, I've been there too where I bought stuff. And I'm like, darn it. Yeah. It's just not working. <laughs> but that's part of trial and error. And I guess I'm, you know, I'm glad that you showed up today because yeah. you can learn through my decades of trial and error. And yeah. believe me, I have made some big errors <laughs> myself. <laughs> that's how we learn, right? <laughs> like you have had a tank since I was like 10 years old. <laughs> and now, you know, I'm just getting the plant piece of it. Yeah. My son did the plants for a while and I enjoyed that, but it's yeah. gone now. So. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, um, Technology has changed a lot in the last 10 years in particular. It, this hobby has evolved at a crazy fast rate. Because um, I was in salt water for a while and I don't do that anymore. But when I got back into the freshwater world, there's all these new products. Like, I don't have to go dig around in dirt anymore and mess around with that stuff. Uh, I, I love the aquarium soil. But if you're looking to get on a budget, dirt's great. Pool filter sand. Yeah. Um, Regardless, it needs to be something soft and porous for the roots to grow in. Um, and something with nutrients. Seems like there's a lot more varieties of fish than there used to be too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was talking with someone recently about fish trends, you know, like orange von Rio Tetra used to be very common and you barely ever see them anymore. And that's just because there's new species that are popular and there's only so many tanks in the store to house fish. But yeah, there's there's always new ones popping up. Um, I like my, I like a lot of my old school fish, Cardinal Tetra. I do. I mean, they're, yeah, Rummy Nose. And they, they breed easily. You can buy captive bred ones. You know, you're not taxing the environment that way. And, and they're pretty hardy. You know, like a lot of these new fish, that are less is known about them. I don't want to experiment in my tank. For me, keeping aquariums is not about keeping the hardest species out there. Uh, although I know for some people it is, and that's fine. But I got too many tanks to spend that much time worrying about one tank, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, like I used to do discus and <laughs> nightmare. I never do that. I love them, but man, they're tough. Yeah, that's a full-time job to yeah. have of discus. Yeah. So a dirty tank, this is an example. It's one of the few pictures that's not for me. It's just a stock photo. But um, like I said, it's cheap. And you can grow healthy plant communities. But if you think about some of the other like aquascape tanks I've had so far <coughs> in this presentation, you'll see that there isn't much depth here. It's a flat bottom and there's pockets of plants here and there. It doesn't quite fill in the same way. Um, but if you're just looking to create... Uh, um, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Um, if you're looking to just create a healthy environment for your fish and you don't want to hassle with all this aquascaping, this is the perfect way to go. So... Um, some people really hate this process of setting up tanks. They're like, geez, that looks like a lot of work. And it's a labor of love. It's a hobby that we enjoy. If not, this is a terrific way to get your fish a healthy habitat, enjoy a slice of nature at home, and still add some wood and rocks in and make it look pretty. Oh, <laughs> we were just looking at this exact product, but um, it's more expensive. Another advantage to using this over the dirt and sand is that it provides a better home for beneficial bacteria. So if you think about bacteria living in porous surfaces, that's what this is. It's hard for them to go in and out of the sand or for the water to move in and out of the sand as easily as it does through this. So a common misconception is that you need to cap aquarium soil with sand. Otherwise, it leaches nutrients. 
Not true. Maybe for the first week or so, when you pour in water the first time, yeah, you'll see stuff get kicked up, that's nutrients. But afterwards, not the case. Um, so if you're on YouTube, there's one guy, I want to mention his name, but he's, he's kind of like aggressive when it comes to using this and he'll say you're doing it wrong. He's even like gone around my channel leaving nasty comments <laughs> and he's, he's got a ton of followers and that's like this divisive nature that I don't like. You know, you can do things different ways, doesn't make it right or wrong. There's just pros and cons and that's what I'd like people to really take away is keeping an open mind and recognizing the pros and cons of different approaches. Heater! We live in Colorado. You'll need a heater to keep fish most of the year. Even in my basement in the summer, it gets chilly and that heater gets going a little bit, even in the summertime. Um, if you keep cool water fish, you don't need a heater per se, but even goldfish like it are in the low to mid 70s. Upgrades, we talked about this, CO2. I love CO2. So I've been taking care of a tank for maybe five months now and the lady just bought CO2 and I go by every two weeks. My first two week cycle um, with CO2, there's barely any algae in there. I used to scrub, 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 now there is none because the plants are healthier, they're consuming the nutrients, they're absorbing the light, the plants are growing like crazy now, tons of new leaves even in two weeks. So not essential, but I love CO2. And I don't have it in every tank at home because it is expensive. Well, that's not crazy expensive, but it, it adds some money to set up this. Yeah. Getting the equipment is not expensive. Is there any correlation to the tank size to the size of the diffuser? No. no. Well, I guess that you could get a bigger diffuser, like uh, if you have a canister filter, do you have one? Mm -hmm. You can get an inline diffuser. Mm -hmm. And so you cut your your tube. plumbing, yeah, your yeah. tube that goes from the filter to your tank, mm -hmm. and then you plug in this inline diffuser. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically a, a plastic cylinder with a ceramic ring, mm -hmm. and the inside of the ring, water's flowing, and the outside, there's CO2 that gets pumped in, and because it's a high pressure, it fizzles into the water and gets pumped into your tank. And so your canister filter does a good job at circulating, mm -hmm. so then you're already getting that CO2 blessing all around your tank. That's the most efficient way to do it. But a tank like that, you couldn't do it, or a tank with a hang-on back, you couldn't do it. Yeah. And with a tank with a hang-on back filter, it's almost, it's not pointless, but it's very hard to get good CO2 circulation. Because the hang on the back doesn't circulate as well as the canister. Yeah. Because it, it's not a stream. Exactly, like, yeah. You get yeah. part of it going like Turning, this, totally. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it also puts a ton of oxygen into the water and the agitates the, the surface. The water quality. Exactly, yeah. Right. And because of that surface agitation, it's harder to retain CO2. Oh. It's going to leave the tank faster. Okay. Um, so if you had like a fan or a wave maker or something that's making a lot of surface agitation, you would lose some of your CO2? In, no, if it's inside the tank, that's okay. You might lose a little bit, but in, in my tank, I know because I have my outflow towards the surface, I like yeah. a little bit of agitation. Yeah. I know I'm losing a lot of CO2, so I'm pumping in like, oh, it's like a, when you look at the air bubbles, it's like a machine gun. So, which is way more than people would recommend. Huh. But every tank is different. So my surf, my efficiency is very low in that tank, but CO2 is dirt cheap. It's the setup that's expensive, mm -hmm. you know? And, and even then compared to a nice tank and stand and stuff, the CO2 is not that bad, sure. but- Is it um, better to use like, I just bought one of those, um, bar things with the holes in it. Uh-huh. Is, like is, is that okay or is it would you rather rather have the I prefer just to oh, with CO2 or CO2. Yeah, with CO2 that's not recommended because what happens is the bubbles get stuck at the top of that uh spray bar 
because the holes are along the side. Mm-hmm. And so then they accumulate at the top. They they slowly fizzle up to the top, and then they come out as big bubbles. Are you noticing that? No. Okay. But you kind of I don't really pay yeah. attention to it. But. <laughs> like the CO2 is pumped down below, it just like kind of gathers on that yeah, surface so, and then just bubbles out. Like underneath the bar, between the bar and the aquarium? Uh, no, let me... I think I can draw on this. Oh, oh, oh. oh okay, good. <laughs> good with fish technology, that's about it. <laughs> All right, so if you have your... If you have your spray bar like this, and it's coming in this way, you have your holes. Mm-hmm. It's flowing in here. A lot of the little bubbles end up going to the top. Oh, inside? Of the inside area. the spray bar. Oh. And so then they accumulate up there rather than getting pumped straight out. And then the bubbles flow right to the surface. And that's if you have the inline diffuser. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, if you don't have the inline diffuser, it's not as important. But even if you don't, I'd still recommend just using a straight, a straight outflow and then putting your diffuser under that to the side. So you give it a little bit of space. So the bubbles are coming up here and then the water is flowing here. That way it has time to pick it up and pick it. Exactly, yeah. When you do this method, it's a lot harder to efficiently pump CO2 around. And so one of those- It seems like it, because I put the diffuser here and then I put the CO2 and it doesn't ever change. Yeah. Try try taking your spray bar off and then, you know, you have your outflow here and put your CO2 here, and it should pick it up. One of the things you can think about, um, which helps me in my head, is let's say you want the CO2 to be in your tank longer. Yeah. If it goes right up to the surface, you're wasting it, mm-hmm. which is what happens in my big tank. But since I have a 20 pound cylinder, I don't really care. Um, but. The longer that CO2 is pumping around your tank, the more it's diffusing in there, and the more your plants are going to suck it up and use it. Yeah, the spray bar is fun, but it's not ideal for CO2. And that tank that I just set it up on um, did have a spray bar before, and I got rid of the spray bar and moved over to this. You know, my angelfish used to always lay eggs before I put that in there, and they don't anymore. Mm-hmm. Ah, Isn't that weird? The spray bar, huh? They just don't like all the... I don't, they don't like, I, I guess they liked that current. Yeah. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. The tropical community likes the current. Yeah. They're like, check yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They do. River fish do like the current yeah. a lot. Yeah. When you get longer, longer fin fish, like gummies yeah. and bettas, they're less. Yeah, just all the tetras and barbs and stuff like dart in and out of it and stuff. I love seeing that. And then when you fill up the tank, they're always swimming in the oh, yeah. water too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They love it. Um, oh yeah, and then an auto doser. So completely unnecessary. But if you're a scatterbrain like me, and What's you're an auto doser uh, is a pump that takes fertilizer and adds it to your aquarium. Oh. So on my fancy tank at home, sometimes I'm using a few different types of fertilizers. And I don't want to hassle with that. So I just use the auto doser. I don't think about it. Every day it puts the same amount in, done deal. But like I said, not necessary. I would do CO2 before I did auto doser. But I used to travel a lot for work and I didn't want my partner to have to deal with all this. She sure, had to feed five different tanks. Like, she's like, what? this guy's crazy. So yeah, uh, that was part of it. And. I mean, I would forget a lot. Yeah. Like it's it's hard to remember to do that every day. Yeah. So the process. This is how I do it. 
The first thing I like to do is get my equipment squared away. That's the least fun part. Knock it out, cut your tubing, make sure everything lines up, your heater is in there, all that jazz. And then these two are interchangeable. It depends on the tank. So if you're doing that layout where you just kind of throw things together, you likely do the substrate first and then the hardscape. But sometimes in really fancy tanks where you need to glue wood to the bottom because it's like a tree, then you'll do that first and then put the substrate in afterwards. Sometimes it's kind of a middle ground. You'll see with my real life example here in a sec. And then planting, fill the tank, patience, patience, patience. <laughs> it's one, one good thing that you learn from this hobby that's not biology and chemistry stuff. So substrate, this is the substrate that I like. This tank already had this piece of wood in here. It was stuck. Yeah, yes. you know, one of my clients bought it for their father, or no, his daughter bought it for him, and uh, literally could not take this piece of wood out of the tank. It had uh, absorbed water and expanded, and so because of the bracket or the brace up top, wow. you can't pull it out. Wow. So, yeah, we'll go into a little more detail regarding hardscape and even though there's a really cool chunk it's like you suck it. it yeah and not only that but on its own it's not as cool as it could be God. with other elements it's an unfinished piece of work uh -huh. so we get that substrate in smooth it out i always like to slope it up towards the back because fish turns roll down and then whatever the human out Exactly, yeah. And then wherever your filter is, the intake, at the bottom, that's where the gunkiest spot in your tank will be. So I notice in my tank at the bottom by the filter, it's gunky. You slope up towards the back, also by the filter, nothing there. Everything is at the bottom and the front. So it makes cleaning easier. I don't want to siphon everywhere, especially when I have a carpet. Um, and then hardscape. Pretty straightforward. You know, we have this tree here, this this uh, gnarled root, I call this tank, and you want to start tucking rocks under it. You want to make it look like nature. So roots grow over rocks in nature. The rocks are usually there first, and then the trees, even, you know, where we live, uh, fire is a huge part of our ecosystem. So even after a fire, the rocks will remain and then the new trees and roots will grow over the rocks. So what kind of rocks and wood are okay to use? You can find rocks. I like to use granite and river stones. I say don't use limestone, but I've kind of changed my mind since, um, since, since I, I put this slide together a while ago. but. Um, it depends what fish you're using, you know, raise your pH and add some of those things to the water. If you have a ton of limestone in your tank, it might not be ideal for sensitive fish that like low pH um, and soft water. Plants like soft water too. We're fortunate that we have soft tap water. It's perfect for plants. But if you have a ton of limestone and you're not doing many water changes, then that will accumulate in your tank, make it hard, which is less optimal. Um, you can go to the landscape store to get river pebbles and granite. Granite is super cheap from the landscape store. It's not quite as much texture as like dragonstone or Syrian stone, but still pretty. And then the aquarium store, you can get ready to spend some serious money for a big tank at least. You know, a small one is pretty affordable, but... Like dragonstone in the, in the plastic there was from the fish store, so that costs a lot. The uh, granite there they just said we sell it by the ton take it for free yeah so yeah right and so pick that up and, uh, it's yeah. crazy the yeah. difference yeah yeah but um you know if you have something really specific in mind that you're going for a yeah. specific layout then it is what it is this is uh, this is a hobby yeah expect to spend money if you want to if not there's workarounds um, you can also find stuff like uh, Red Feather is a great place to collect materials. Um, when it comes to wood, 
You want to find wood that's been baking in the sun for a while, doesn't have any fungus on it. You're always going to find evidence of insects out here because of bark beetles. But you want to make sure there's no actual living insects in there. So if it's been baking in the sun for a couple of years, you're probably fine. If it's newly dead and you see little spores or eggs or fungus, mushrooms or other non-mushroom fungus things, just leave it there. If you pick it up and it feels waterlogged heavy, leave it. If it smells like really sappy, not good. Um, you can wash or boil stuff if possible. For big tanks, it's hard because, uh, you know, pots, <laughs> unless you have a cauldron or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. Yeah. My wood, my water logging tank. With like a fine turkey. Yeah, the boiler thing. <laughs> yeah, I do have I do have one big one in my <laughs> garage just for this. Um, but if you follow these rules for collecting, it's not that big of a deal. I some people are absolutely paranoid. They're like, oh, you can't use conifers. Not true. That's all I use evergreens because that's all that grows out here. Um, and then. Wood will float, so you need to weigh it down. You can glue it down as well. And then um, it will put tannins in the water. Not bad for your fish, but your water will be brown. It's nothing to worry about. And eventually that will dissipate as time goes on. So how do you attach wood to rocks so it doesn't float? The best way is with silicone, but that takes 24 to 48 hours to cure. The other method is super glue, liquid super glue, paper towel. You wedge that paper towel in a contact point. You douse it down with some liquid super glue. 15 seconds later, you'll see some steam coming up. That's the chemical reaction. And I'd wait another 30 seconds so you don't get your finger stuck to it. Mm -hmm. But you can tap it rock solid. It also works for random household fixes. Now, it's not as strong as silicone. For a chunk like this, I probably weighed it down at maybe five different anchor points. Okay. Just super, like just straight up super glue from the hardware store. Liquid super. It doesn't matter what kind. Okay. Yeah. So. Gel was not ideal. Okay. What's the paper towel do? It's like a matrix. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's like a matrix. So it, it. Let's say you have a very small contact point, like just. Two points. This will kind of clump around and allow a larger surface area of connection. And then when you douse it down, instead of having that really small contact point, it's a larger contact point. And the liquid super glue on its own, for some reason, doesn't do as good of a job. But once you add that, it, it's crazy how well it works. Not as strong though, when you bump it, it will break if you bump it too hard or if you scrub it. So in a tank where I know there's going to be some heavy scrubbing, I use silicone and I plan it ahead. Um, but as you can see here, I added to this, you know, I added roots there and down here I added some more and out there. Um, and then you just want to add different sizes of everything, different sizes of rocks and wood. It helps it to make it look more natural. When you have one rock and one piece of wood, it looks like it's missing something. And the best way to, to create an interesting, aesthetically pleasing design is to add more details everywhere. One thing to keep in mind though is plants will grow. So a really small pebble on this stuff is, is garbage. It's a waste of time. Putting that on sand is the way to go because nothing's growing on the sand and then you can see all those fine details. Mm -hmm. So that's why I only have larger rocks and you'll see in a second what it looks like when the plants fill in. Uh, planting, pretty straightforward process. You use your planting forceps. Definitely a good investment if you don't have one. Um, and one with sharp tips. Uh, Fluval ones are blunt at the end. I don't like them. Even though I do like them as a company, I don't like their planting forceps. Um, I, don't I got a Timu. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're probably fine. Yeah. That's the only, yeah. Um, and you, you just want the roots to be under the substrate. This plant is called Monte Carlo. That one, you almost want to bury like 70% of it. Because it, for Monte Carlo, yeah, every plant's oh. different. Oh. But this one, it grows quick enough if you get healthy clippings like this one, um, it will grow out quickly because it has an energy reserve. But if it's not rooted well, then it doesn't establish as quickly. So even though it doesn't look great when you immediately, like immediately after the layout or the setup, it allows for faster filling in that way. So you just have to look up like, every plant and see how they like. What um, these are just kind of things you learn over the years. Okay. Um, you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> you could just ask me. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, types of plants, foreground, midground, background, epiphytes. So pretty obvious foreground plants here, they don't grow that tall. And then midground plants here, these are also epiphytes and then background plants. So you always stagger them that way. If you put your tallest plant in the front by the glass, you won't see anything. Um, I know a lot of people that do that. I think they just don't think about it and stuff. But if you're really trying to take your aquascaping to the next level, that's something you should definitely consider. And then epiphytes are great. These java ferns, hygrophila pinatifida, moss, those are plants that don't set their roots in the substrate. Some of them have rhizomes like the java fern, and they might send roots into the soil, but their rhizome needs to be above the soil because they need oxygen. So that kind of um, makes it convenient because you might have these spots where you have large chunks of wood and rocks, and you need to tie in some space between the front and the back. And like, this is all rock and wood here. There's no space to plant things in the substrate. It's good habitat for the fish they can hide. So what I've done is I've just tucked these plants into the nooks and crannies. You can also use gel super glue in this case, not liquid, um, to attach them to rocks and wood. It doesn't kill the plant. You just you don't want to smother them, but yeah, you can do it in a few spots. Yeah. So yeah, here we go, gel super glue. That's how I got this guy here. This one I was able to tuck in there and tuck in there. And then the moss I use super glue. <laughs> also, when you're setting up a tank like this, you want to be spraying it down frequently. Those plants will dry out. Um, and then I pour a little bit of water in the bottom to help with the carpeting plants. Some people don't like planting in wet substrate, but I kind of prefer it that way. Mm. Um, yeah. And then you can see in that last picture, I've added more roots here, up there. But I, I was really thinking, cognizant of the fact that plants will fill in here. There's no point in adding fine roots and details to where the carpeting plant will fill in. Sure. And then that also makes it hassle when you're trying to trim it and you hit rocks. That's not good for your shears. Sure. Is that literally roots uh, that you found? Like, yeah. How do you get? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I do a lot of hiking for fun, yeah. and okay. I'm also an aquarium addict, so sure. every time I'm out, I'm like, whoa. So you're just like, yeah. so that's Ooh. like literally like roots off of like trees or bushes or something that you're just cutting off and like cleaning up. And uh, I'm not cutting them off. They're all from dead stuff. Okay. So the roots follow the same rules as collecting wood. Okay. So Dry I go to red thing. feather because I know where there are some... Um, fire breaks so when there was the cameron peak fire yeah. a few years back uh -huh. and red feather was starting to burn they went through and like dur -dur, dozed out these huge lines to stop the fire yeah and so they they just wrecked all these trees uh -huh. and they also create these huge piles that they're supposed to burn yeah but they still haven't burned them uh -huh. so i just go there and collect stuff they're already dead yeah and um they're they're gonna eventually burn so that 
they're not out there as fuels for the next wildfire. So it's kind of nice that way. You're not impacting living trees. I mean, sure. but even beyond that, you don't want a living one because it's got the saps in it. Yeah. That's why people say don't use evergreens because they smell sap. But other trees have saps and resins too. You're just not as pungent. Um, there's a reason that pine people love the way pine soul, pine smells, you know, um, cause it's so do, you, do you still like boil that? No, I'm just cleaning it up a little. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm really not paranoid. Okay, cool. As long as there's no fungus or waterlogged, okay. you know, you give it a quick scrub down or something, but, um, yeah, this is probably ponderosa pine Got it. or some sort of spruce. That's mainly what grows out of red feather. I do try and stay away from aspen because I just don't know how well that would do underwater. Yeah. And cottonwood, I would stay away from that. The other things you might see out if you go to, you know, red featherish areas. Feel very slowly. Mm -hmm. You can mess up your whole tank by dumping a five gallon bucket of water in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, all these plants will just get uprooted. And so I like my hose, it connects to a faucet. It's really easy to set it to a low pressure, gradually fill, and then I cut it right there and put that little bend in there. I just went to Home Depot, bought some parts for that. Um, and then at the end, I put a little sponge in there so that the water doesn't spray out in one flow. It, it uh, filters it out into a very soft release. Patience, three months later, wow. everything looks great. But you can see there's a reason why I didn't put all that detail on the bottom, all for nothing. And then it will make maintaining those plants a lot harder to have detail there. Um, thank you. I've since actually removed this plant and this plant has grown to be this big. So I'm just hacking away at stuff in that tank. <laughs> Uh, maintenance. So you've gone through all this effort to set up a nice aquarium. What's some maintenance that you'll need to stay on top of? I love my weekly 50% water changes, light filter clean, scrubbing the glass, and equipment check. In my 75 gallon, I can do that in under an hour. But then once a month, I like to take more time, maybe two hours, sometimes even three hours to go through everything. You can crack open a brewski, get some music going, like should be a fun process. Find whatever you like or some YouTube or whatever. Um, trimming plants, essential part of maintenance. If you don't trim properly, your tank will never look good. It's, it's how you also get a tank to fill out. So we'll, Cover trimming in a lot of detail. I'm not gonna cover the other stuff unless anyone's got questions. It's kind of boring, like, you know how to scrub glass and... What do you use to build and drain? Do you just drain in buckets and... No. I use this hose. This hose is a 50 footer. It hooks it all in, drain? Yeah. So I can just put it right out into my garden through the, the door or window. Yeah. And um, in the winter, sometimes I don't. It's like really cold outside, it just turned to ice. So um, this water is great for plants too. I yeah. my zucchinis and tomatoes and stuff. I don't use any other fertilizers, just this stuff. Um, sometimes to drain it though, I will take a smaller hose to get some of the nooks and crannies and stuff. Um, yeah. So you can't like, cause I'm used to like gravel back, like not planted, but I'm trying to learn this. So like you just drain the water up in the area that's just water. You're not going around siphoning around the base. You do want to do a little bit of that, uh -huh. but you don't use the gravel back per se. Okay. Especially in the first month or two when your plants are setting root. root. Yeah, if you siphon them then, you're going to undo that progress. So mm -hmm. uh, wait till you see roots everywhere before you start messing with them. Okay. But 
you can use your hand to kind of brush it and agitate things into the water column okay. and then siphon it. You can also zip tie a turkey baster to your hose and you can blast it while it's siphoning and that will get a more concentrated area of debris kick up. Okay. Whereas if you use your hand, it goes everywhere and you can't really siphon it that easily. Mm. So turkey baster and, and hose are a great option. But you do, that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about that one gunky spot. Yeah. Every tank has some gunky spots and you can focus on those areas with the small hose. I maybe drain 10% of that, 15% once a month doing that. And then the rest of the time, I just use this hose. A lot of the stuff gets you picked up the, in your filter. The, the sponge out? Nope, because I have shrimp in these tanks and then uh, it prevents shrimp or small fish from getting sucked in. Okay. Yeah. So it's Otherwise, so you'll find shrimp in your shower um. or wherever. <laughs> I've never had that happen. <laughs> Um, yeah, the deep filter clean. And then to test your water quality too, because you want to make sure that your fertilizers are doing well. As your plant matures, you might need to alter how much fertilizer you put in there, especially if you're using stem plants. Stem plants suck up a ton of nutrients. So trimming, very important part of maintenance. Mention that anytime you trim most aquarium plants, there, two heads will come out. So when I said it's essential for filling out your tank, that's why. You don't need to buy three million plants if you have a little bit of patience. Still a good idea to pack a lot of plants from the get-go. But the other thing to consider is wherever you clip a plant, they have nodes where the leaves come out of. The node under where you clip will often send roots out. So. You don't want to trim right along the surface because that's going to create ugly growth in the future. Um, and then you can replant all the heads that you've clipped. So exceptions would be like lotus plants, lilies, and um, grasses, Amazon swords. Those won't, you can't replant the clipping from that unless they're a shooter, side shooter. Um, so we'll take this tank for example. I have this huge, uh, not that big, but this big log there, and this line indicates where I like to trim. So above, it's just all this healthy stem growth. But if you see right here, there's some roots coming down, and then under here, it's all rooty. It doesn't look that nice. Perfect habitat for fish. They spawn in there. Babies get eaten, but. They love it. They hang out back there all the time. And because I trim along here, I don't have to see that ugly growth above. But let's say you don't have this big chunk of wood here. That's what your mid-ground plants are for. You stagger your mid-ground plants in between. That way when you trim your background plants, you trim them at about the height of your mid-ground plants. Mm -hmm. And then you just take those clippings and bloop, Plant it back in. Right away, you just like put yeah. it down. So yeah, I usually them. collect them while I'm trimming, uh -huh. and then afterwards, you'll have an idea of where the open spots are, you know, and then eventually, like these plants, I don't replant them anymore. This is a new species in here, so I'm trying to get it to fill out. I replant that one. But I get so many clippings from my tank. And I use it when I set up new tanks. You're trimming like once a month. <coughs> So you you resell them to your clients then? And so I it depends. For my clients that I have set up their tank for, then I kind of consider them part of the plant club. And so if I'm doing weekly maintenance, then I take plants from them and I give plants to them. But if it's like uh, if it's a tank I'm setting up for the first time, then yes, I do sell them. <clears throat> Keep up with maintenance. All right, I'm not going to go over everything. Like I mentioned, it's boring. You don't need to know how to scrub glass. Um, although, actually, I should note that um, when you clean by your silicone seals on the glass, you never want to 
go parallel with the seal like this because you can end up going in and scraping it out. Yeah, if you're using a blade, you scrape right up to the butt of the seal. Um, otherwise, sponges are great too. I have a um, 30 gallon hex tank that's 30 years old, 32 oh, years old, yeah. that's been resealed. Oh gosh, is that make you nervous? <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Okay. It seems fine, but. <laughs> yeah, just a matter of. It's always been full of water. I've had it going for 30 years. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and if the seals look good, then it's fine. Seems like they're fine. Yeah, just keep an eye on it. I did have one of those leak on me once. Mm -hmm. It was a 30-year-old hex tank. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like a 28-gallon yeah. or something. It's just like, oh, no. No, I'm going to be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it partially depends on who had it before. Maybe they were scraping parallel or, like, doing other stupid stuff. It came from a really crazy house. Like they had pigs running around. <laughs> that tank smelled of. I don't know how glass can smell of pigs, but it did. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, it was. I used to work at this fish store in Durango, and we would go take tanks from people sometimes. And my boss is like, "Oh yeah, you can have a tank if you come help me work for the day." Are you sure? That was the tank I got. <laughs> Smell. Once it stopped smelling, it started leaking. So. <laughs> One thing, never a free one thing after another. Yeah, <laughs> never exactly. Nothing's free, right? It's like a free dog. <laughs> <laughs> totally. All right. Algae, if you don't do your maintenance, you'll get algae, and algae sucks. Um, little bit's okay, it's good for fish, but you don't want a full on algae bloom in your tank. And small bits can actually make the tank look really pretty, but yeah, we, yeah. So it's the number reason, number one reason people quit the hobby. I get calls where people are like, I'm just tired of this. I don't want to do aquariums anymore. I hate algae. La -di -da -di. You will get an algae bloom at some point if you keep planting tanks long enough. I mean, I've dealt with it. It's part of the process, so don't let it get you down. It builds character. You'll figure out a solution and I'll help you through it. And you'll be that much better afterwards because you'll know how to deal with it. You'll fix your mistake and you won't make it again. Or you will, but you'll. So I kind of touched on this earlier, but the reason you get algae is because there's an imbalance between lights, nutrients, and CO2. So the most common reason I see algae is too much light combined with high nutrients in the water column. So if you are experiencing algae, it can kind of depend on the specific types of algae. I mean, we can go over them in more detail, actually. I'll we'll have to resolve it. So the seven most common types of algae, black beard, brown hair, green hair, green spot, green dust, green water, and cyanobacteria. Cyano is not actually an algae, but it's pretty much for all intents and purposes. It looks greenish blue, and it grows in kind of a mat. It's the only one that when you pull out, it feels like spongy, slimy, and it smells a little funky. Mm -hmm. None of the other algae yeah. when you pull out will smell, but this one, you'd be like, ooh. Mm -hmm. It's got some odor. It's not like really horrible, but, and it can grow like crazy. Mm -hmm. Blackbeard, since that's one that, we'll focus on a couple. Because blackbeard is, is very common. Blackbeard usually results in low CO2, or results from low CO2, high lighting, and high organic matter buildup. So if there is like that gunky layer along the bottom of your tank, if that's accumulating, that's associated with blackbeard. Um, the only other cause for blackbeard which is crazy because it's the opposite of what I just said, is too much CO2 and too much flow. So I noticed in my tank where I have my inline diffuser, where it comes out, if it just blasts CO2 on a chunk of wood, that wood will get black beard algae. Mm. So is it, like, is it real short and yep. fuzzy? Yeah. Yeah, mine looks a little darker than that, though. There's a fair bit of variation. Is there? Blackbeard can be anywhere from light gray 
to full on dark black. Mm. Mm. The black, but um, yeah. So the first thing you want to do is try and remove as much as, as you can. It's hard to remove physically because it's yeah. stubborn. Yeah, especially the short stuff. So what you can do is turn your water off. Like when you're doing water change, after your water change, you can take some Excel, which is an algicide or bioavailable carbon source. It's really an algicide, but... I had no idea that was an algicide. Yeah, it's marketed it's in a fertilizer pack. Yeah. You know, that's how I ended up with it. Yeah. It really, it is an algaecide. Um, so you can take that, just be sure you follow the dosage because too much is bad for your fish. And for some types of plants like Valsinaria, doesn't always respond well to it, but um, you can take it with a syringe and spray the areas down that have blackbeard. And after you do a 50% water change, you're allowed to do more uh, Excel. So, then you'll see your algae is dying. It's turning like grayish red sometimes when it dies. And then your critters will eat it. Mm. No one will eat it when it's alive. Mm. It must taste really bad. Or it's like cooking your broccoli or something. <laughs> so um, that's what I would do with Blackbeard. Can you spray it like right on leaves? Like yeah. Light? Okay. Yeah, totally. But you want to turn your water off for 10 minutes and let it sit there so that it kind of floats around. If you have the water circulating when you spray it, it will just get blasted around the tank. Do you mean like drain the water lines the plants are sticking above and then spray it there? Or nope. literally yeah. underneath? Literally just... underneath. Okay, like with a little pipette or something? Yeah. We can, uh, I've got some videos we can okay. go over that afterwards. Interesting. So I have um, a little bit of that going on in my community. Yeah, I think it's almost inevitable. You see yeah. videos online and you're like, wow, I got a perfect tank. But then you can look at it closer, there's algae. I mean, it's a natural part of the ecosystem. You want your tank, your plants to have all these nutrients and light and CO2 and whatever. Well, algae likes that too. It's going to be there. Um, green hair algae is another one that I deal with a lot. And that one is usually the same deal as Blackbeard, except flow is very important. If there's low flow, you're going to see more green hair algae. And so in virtually every case, you're just going to want to lower your lights or add more CO2. Those are your two basic options. If you test your water and it turns out you have crazy high nitrates, like above 15 or 20 parts per million, that's not crazy, but you know, when we're getting into 50, 60, 70, 80 parts per million, and you're blasting strong light on that tank, that's gonna for sure result in algae. So one of the reasons that when I talk about weekly water changes, if you're using fertilizers, it can gradually accumulate through the week. And that's called estimated indexing. It's where you're not really giving the plants just what they need, you're like, I don't know exactly how much you need, so I'll give you two or three times as much. That way you have all the food you need to grow. And then the end of the week, you need to do that big water change to reset the cycle. Um, tanks like that, if they're not getting water changes, crazy algae will result. Um, tanks with big fish and lots of big turds and stagnant spots are prone to algae. Mm -hmm. So making sure you get good flow is a huge thing to combat algae. And then those water changes, there's something about it that algae hates. Sometimes I'll see algae die after a water change, um, just like turn that whitish, reddish color, and then shrimp will eat it. Um, green spot algae is very common. That's a sign of low phosphates in the tank. So that algae is different from most of the others in that it shows up when there's a deficiency, a very specific deficiency. And so in that case, you might want to add a little more fertilizer. Um, green dust is usually a symptom of a new tank. I wouldn't worry too much about that if it's a new tank and your plant communities are still filling in. 
it'll usually take care of itself. Green water is a sign of way too much light. Your tank is by the window most likely getting blasted. That's literally when the tank water is green. Um, cyanobacteria, kind of similar in the fact that um, it's a symptom of too much light and nutrients. Whereas you can get green water with just light, it doesn't have to have a ton of nutrients in there. And actually, the once you get a ton of algae, it can kind of filter your water. So you need to be cautious if you go and remove a ton of algae from a tank without fixing the root problem, then you might have, yeah, you might have a ton of nutrients show up in your tank because you're pulling stuff out that was consuming those nutrients. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to just remove algae. You need to always think about what's causing it. So with your tank with Blackbeard, what kind of light are you using? It's a really nice, so um, I, I use a Hiker. Okay, They're, yeah. It's a, I don't know, it's at least 7500. Yeah, those are great lights. It's a good light, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and then I, well, after we chatted online, I increased the CO2 and stuff, and it seems like it's better, but yeah. you know, what's there is just not dying. Yeah, it won't die unless you spray it with something. I could take the wood out, actually. I could paint the cell on the Blackbird LED if that would work. Yeah, you could. There's some um, hydrogen peroxide spray, too. Oh, I've done that before. Too. Yeah, that didn't kill it. Blackbeard is super hardy. It doesn't want to yeah. die. Oh. I do have some little ferns tacked on there in places. Mm -hmm. It's right around those. It won't hurt it if I it won't hurt the ferns. Yeah, the ferns are fine with that. Um, and then oh, brown hair algae that you'll see when you use granite and mm -hmm. or sand so brown hair algae is a diatomaceous algae diatoms use silica to build their cell walls and so uh, silica just gets kicked up in the water um, when you fill it up from sand the sand is silica so you're feeding it but then after a few weeks um, well, after a few weeks of a new tank is when you usually see brown hair algae, but it takes care of itself. You can use a toothbrush to get some of it off, but it's not like some of these other algaes where I was just saying you need to think about the root cause. The root cause of brown hair algae is it's a new tank with silica, and that silica will get depleted if you do water changes. Um, and usually it comes and goes quick. So it can be scary because you're like, bam, there's all this brown hair algae. Whoa. But it takes care of itself. You know, unless it's smothering plants, you don't really even need to worry about it that much. And it is easy to scrub off, unlike black beard. And cyanobacteria, you can use uh, cyano down, or chemiclean is what it's called. It's a... Uh, um, it, it's designed, I use it mostly for reef tanks, but um, it's an antibiotic essentially that kills the cyanobacteria. I can't remember if it hurts your beneficial bacteria or not, but um, the other way is to do a complete blackout. You can cover your tank with a towel or blanket for up to five, six days and that should smother a lot of these algaes and give you the upper hand on them. Your plants can tolerate it for five or six days before they really start to suffer. But a lot of these plants grow in tropics anyways where you can get big storms that last for a long time, you know. Not like Colorado, you use the sunshine every day. Um, so they do have some dark tolerance. Manually removing algae should be part of your monthly maintenance, if not weekly maintenance. If you're struggling with algae, you need to integrate that into your weekly maintenance. If you're not struggling with algae, even still you need to scrub your glass down because then it will appear afterwards. Algae crew. So these guys are not a magic fix for algae, but they're going to help you. There should be one tool in your kit for dealing with algae. Mm -hmm. um, Plecos, auto sinkless, amanos, and cherries. Those are my go-tos. That's not a definitive list, though. It's what I found to be 
not only the most efficient, but most fun to have in your tank. Can you put them with the angelfish? Can you put the shrimp with the angelfish? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, just eat them. they'd be an expensive snack for your angel okay. fish. Yeah, totally. Uh, cherry shrimp. I love cherry shrimp. So much fun. Your angels will snag on them real quick. They're good at eating biofilm, so if you touch a smooth rock in your tank, you'll notice it's a little slimy or slick. The film layer, that's biofilm. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's basically a precursor to algae. And so, even though the cherry shrimp aren't the best algae eaters per se, they're going around cleaning this rock up of, of that film before it turns to algae. So that layer um, provides good growth, like uh, in vitro gel or something for algae, basically. Monostrand, these are the best algae eaters as far as I'm concerned. They're also really fun, they get bigger than the monos. Uh, they will not reproduce in your tank, unfortunately, because they need salt water for their larval life cycle. Even though they will get pregnant, and you'll see the eggs. They're just busy shrimp. Really good. They eat different kinds of algae, too. Whereas some, some critters will only like one type of algae. Um, and unlike fish, their little pinchers, pincers, they get into all those nooks and crannies. Uh, they're very adaptable fish, or uh, shrimp. Autos, I would say, are up there with the monos. They eat different types of algae. They have small mouth parts so they can get into those small leaves that you pluck a wooden. Um, terrific, terrific algae eaters. They do like to be in little groups and they are sensitive to bad water quality. Well, four, so you can put them up? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can always get a few more, but okay. um, compatible with angels. I they might so. be. Yeah. They're fast. Yeah. I think so. They, they got. Yeah. We might look into that, but I think so. I'm pretty sure. And then one of my favorites, just because they're pretty, they're dwarf placostomus. There's different types, but I love the albino bristle nose. Um, male and female. The male gets kind of a more orange red color, and the females stay. Um, a little more consistently this color, whereas the male will kind of change his colors when he's getting frisky, you know? Uh, and they do breed my tank, they get babies. Mm -hmm. They are particularly good at cleaning wood. So they're not great at cleaning rocks off, but as you can see, that's where they are. They're always on the wood. Um, and to some degree, they do chisel away, eat some of the wood, but um, it takes years for them to make a dent in a chunk like that. And then questions, I got answers, hopefully. This is just patience. Um, it took maybe six months to get to this point. It's surprising how fast they plants grow up. Yeah, once, once they really start growing, then they go like crazy. But up until that point, it can take a while. Like this, this you feel like you're in this phase for ages and then it's like overnight you're at this phase once they start sending out their roots and shooters that's when things really the magic happens for me because this looks very man-made right now but once they start reproducing and they send their shoots out and they fill in in a natural sense that's when it, it becomes a nature aquarium mm -hmm. 